that, it is six o'clock Eastern time. So I'm gonna go ahead and officially kick this off. Thanks for hanging out with me for the past couple of minutes, uh, but welcome to the Science of Gene Therapy. This is an industry sponsored session by our, our friends and supporters over at Pfizer. Um, before we get started, I just want to take a minute to thank all of our sponsors, Pfizer being one of them, uh, for their unwavering support and commitment to HFA, uh, particularly over the past year and a half through the pandemic and all the uncertainty that exists. The folks on this screen have been uh, supporters of our organization and make events like Symposium possible. So much thanks to all of the, the sponsors that you see here. Uh, I do want to remind everybody that's watching that you are in a Zoom webinar format, so your video and microphone are not open or on. If you need anything from us or you're experiencing any sort of technical issues, feel free to drop a note in the chat or in the Q&A. If you have speaker uh, questions excuse me, for our speaker, please submit those via the Q&A, and hopefully we'll be able to answer those at the end of the session. Uh, and just as a, a reminder, if you've been around with us, at the end of the session, a session evaluation survey will pop up. It will most likely open in a new web tab, a new browser. So be on the lookout for that. We'd love to hear uh, from you and what you thought about this session. And with that, I am going to uh, introduce and turn it over to our speaker from Pfizer, uh, Cosimo Costa, who's here to tell us all about the science of gene therapy. So welcome. I will be hopping off video and the floor is yours. Thanks for being here. All right. Thanks a lot, Kyle. Uh, good evening. Good afternoon, everybody um, on the call. My name is Cosmo Costa. I'm a field medical director with the rare hematology um, team at Pfizer and Medical Affairs US. Uh, before I get started, I'd like to thank HFA for um, inviting me here this evening to be able to give a presentation to you guys. Hold on, I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, and tonight we'll be talking a little bit around um, the science of gene therapy. But before I kicked off, I wanted to maybe give you a little bit uh, background about myself and how I ended up um, working in medical affairs at Pfizer. So I started off my career, my background, as you can see, is that I was a clinical pharmacist and I worked in critical care uh, at a hospital in uh, Philadelphia called Thomas Jefferson um, University Hospital. So I used to work in the surgical intensive care unit and I loved my job back then at the time. And I really never thought that I would ever uh, pursue any other uh, career outside of that. However, one day, um, something unexpected happened to me. I was working in the unit. We were notified by the trauma team that we were receiving a 26-year-old uh, female patient coming in from a boating accident. Uh, she had severe lacerations to both her arms, uh, her one arm and her left leg, uh, and she was in really critical condition at the time. To my surprise, when the patient arrived, it happened to be my neighbor, my longtime friend, and my high school friend. So that really threw me for a loop that day. Um, over the next couple of days, she continued to deteriorate. Her infection spread through her arm and her leg, and we were unable to control them with any of the antibiotics that were um, currently approved in the U.S. You know, at that time. Surgery came to us on the clinical team with the ID team, infectious disease, and they let us know that, you know, we only had 24 to 36 hours to figure something out to get her um, infection under control, or they were going to have to consider amputation of both her arm and her leg. And I, I was devastated uh, at that time about that. So we huddled together with ID, and it just so happened that we had a new therapeutic uh, anti-infective that just came on board for an investigational study at the hospital. So we haven't treated any other patient with this. So we talked with their family and mom and dad decided that, you know, instead of amputation, that this was worth a, you know, a go for Tracy. Um, so we ended up initiating the antibiotic uh, within 24 to 36 hours, all of her vital signs uh, started to stabilize. So she uh, started to do better. Surgery took off amputation um, uh, at that time off the table. And, you know, it was a long road for Tracy. She was in the hospital for over three months. But at that time, I realized, you know, without that antibiotic, 
Tracy not only might have lost her arm or leg, but she also might have lost her life. And that's when I said to myself, you know, I, I love my job. I love working in the critical care unit, but I don't have the reach that a pharma company can have to change patients' lives, you know, on a much larger scale. So at that point is when I really decided that, you know, I'm going to go and I'm going to pursue a job with a company that not only discovers, but they develop and they make, you know, medicines available for patients that are life changing. So just thought I'd tell you a little bit, you know, about me and how I ended up in pharma uh, and how I got to where I am today. So as I said, we're going to start off with um, the science of gene therapy. Oop, my slides aren't advancing. Let me see. Okay, here we go. All right. So let's begin uh, tonight's presentation trying to really understand, you know, what is the unmet need in rare disorders, right? So we'll define a rare disorder. So a disease or a disorder is defined as being rare in the United States when it affects fewer than 200,000 Americans at any given time. And out of the 7,000 or so known rare diseases, over 80% of them are genetic in origin. So what does that mean? So most of these are inherited and they affect really young children. Unfortunately too, um, we only have approximately 5% uh, availability for treatments for patients with rare disorders at this time. So there's a big unmet medical need for new treatments. And that's where Pfizer really focuses in on genetic medicine and how it may possibly play you know, a big role to help meet this unmet need and close that uh, unmet need uh, gap. So how do rare disease patients' uh, numbers compare to uh, other national priority disease areas? Well, there are so many rare diseases as we saw in the previous slide. The total number of Americans living with the rare disease is in the range of somewhere between 25 and 30 million. So even though uh, each individual rare disease has a low prevalence, you can see on the chart that collectively, if you add up all the patients with a rare disorder, the numbers are similar to, to or greater than the top national priority disease areas in the US. And the one we show here is uh, diabetes. So now let's talk about, you know, why are genes important and what are genes? Uh, so first it's important to understand that the human body is made up of anywhere between 30 and 40 trillion cells. And each of these cells have a specific role to keep the body functioning. And inside of our cells, um, we have individual genetic information, which is packaged as chromosomes. And we can see that from the cartoon down below in the middle of the screen where we have our genetic material uh, chromosomes. Um, and what are these chromosomes made up of? Well, they're made up of genes. And what do genes do? Well, genes give the cell instructions on how to work and what proteins to make. So when genes are either missing or they're incorrect, the cell does not function properly and we are unable to make a functional protein. So in hemophilia, if there's an error in one of the genes, whether that be factor eight or factor nine, we're unable to make functional protein. And then we are unable to secrete that protein in order to control bleeding. I like to use an analogy uh, to try, in case you're having difficulty grasping the difference between genes and chromosomes of a cookbook. We all know what a cookbook is, right? We all have one in our kitchen. We not, might not be the best cooks, but we have a cookbook. So I think of it as the outside covering of the cookbook being our chromosomes, right? So that holds together all of our recipes inside the cookbook. And what do the recipes do? Well, they give us instructions on how to prepare that meal. So what our cookbook cover is like are chromosomes. And the recipes inside the cookbook are our genes. And those uh, recipes, like our genes, give the instructions in order to make uh, protein or that good meal that uh, we hope we can prepare. 
So how is gene therapy um, given? And ultimately, you know, what is the goal of gene therapy? Well, what we are trying to achieve uh, with gene therapy is really to be able to provide a long lasting protection from bleeding by delivering a working copy of a gene, whether that be factor eight or factor nine in hemophilia with a single treatment. Um, so how would we accomplish this? Well, in order to do this, we have to start out with a working copy of a gene where it's listed here with the squiggly line called in another name, a transgene, and it's there in orange. Um, unfortunately though, we're not able to just infuse that transgene, right? We can't just give that to a patient. So we need to use what's called a carrier. And in hemophilia, the carrier of choice that um, are being currently used in the phase three trials are recombinant adeno-associated viral carriers. So what we end up doing is we put that transgene into our carrier, which then gives us a vector. Once we have our vector, then we're able to infuse that into the patient. These carriers that we are using have what we call tropism for a specific target tissue, or in other words, they have an address on the outside of them. And the ones that are being used in hemophilia target our liver. So once we infuse this vector, into the patient, which is usually given into the peripheral vein over anywhere from one to four hours as an outpatient, that vector will travel to your liver and go to your liver cells. Once that vector reaches your liver, it binds to a receptor on the outside of your liver cell or on the outside of your hepatocyte. Once it binds to that receptor, it's taken into the cell by a process called endocytosis, which basically means it's just opening a door to let the vector inside the cell. Once it's inside the cell, it has to travel through your cytoplasm in order to get to your nucleus to deposit that transgene. It does this through a process known as endosomal escape. Once it gets into your nucleus, that carrier will break apart and it deposits our transgene or a working copy of a gene outside of our chromosomes, right? So we're not integrating um, the functional copy of the gene into our genetic makeup. So we could think of it, you know, with the cookbook example that I mentioned earlier, we have our cookbook here. Say your neighbor gives you a new recipe you bring it into your house, you're not putting that recipe inside your cookbook. You're gonna leave it on the counter next to your cookbook. So that's what we're doing in gene transfer here. And it forms what's called an episome. Once this gene forms uh, the episome in your nucleus, it could then use your cell's machinery, natural machinery, to start producing functional factor eight or factor nine. And once it produces that, it's gonna secrete it out into your circulation where then your body would be able to use that in order to control bleeding. Another analogy that you may have heard with this, if you're having difficulty trying to grasp the concept is you know, the Amazon Prime example. So we all know what Amazon Prime is. Uh, so let's say we need it to order a lamp for our uh, nightstand in our bedroom, right? We can't just call Amazon, uh, tell them we need a lamp and they just send the lamp out, right? That lamp would never make it to our house. It would get destroyed. It wouldn't know where to go. So what do they have to do at Amazon Prime? Right? They have to package it, right? So they put it in a box and that box has a, an address on it. So that's what we're doing in gene therapy, right? We're putting our working copy of a gene inside of a carrier that's gonna protect it and allow it to be able to be infused and make it to the target tissue that we need, which is our liver cells. So the same thing with Amazon Prime, right? It's in the box, it goes in the van, it gets delivered to your house, you get a knock on your door, you're gonna open that door and take that box inside. And that's what our liver cells do. Once it binds to the receptor on the outside of the liver, our liver cell will take that carrier inside the cell and it'll take it then up into our nucleus. The same way we'll take the package then up into our bedroom and unpack it. 
So once the vector is in the nucleus, it goes through a process called uncoding, which basically the, the carrier just falls apart. Um, and then the transgene forms our episome outside of our chromosomes, where then it'll start using it, our machinery to start producing functional factor eight or factor nine. Same way our lamp, we put it on the lamp stand and we plug it into the wall to start using the electricity to um, provide light for our bedroom. So now let's look at uh, the different approaches when it comes to genetic medicine, because there are a few that you may have heard of, um, and they do differ in, um, in different ways. The first one that you might have heard of is called um, gene therapy. And this is really, uh, I like to say, a generic term that can be used to describe different techniques uh, to either introduce remove or change a patient's genetic material like DNA or RNA within um, your cells. And the current gene therapy technique that's being used today in the hemophilia phase three trials is called gene transfer. And that's where we are giving or introducing um, to the patient a working copy of the gene that we just went through on the previous slide that typically does not become part of his or her own DNA. So it stays outside of the cookbook, outside of our original DNA. So there's no alteration to the patient's own DNA uh, or genetic code. So you will still be able to pass on your um, original gene you know, to future offspring. The next type of genetic medicine that you might have heard about is called gene editing. Um, and what gene editing is, is it allows for the addition, removal, or alteration of genetic material at specific places in the patient's own DNA. So as you can see here um, from the cartoon, that we have a chromosome, um, right, with a gene that doesn't work that's highlighted in orange. So using special um, proteins, which are depicted here in this, the little scissor cartoon, right? Uh, we can snip out the gene that doesn't work and we can repair and create a working gene that's shown here in green. So future trials, um, you know, may use this technique and it may have an advantage over gene transfer in, you know, providing more of a lifelong change since we're actually manipulating your own um, DNA. However, it does come with some risks and some concerns that if it's not done correctly, you know, there is the possibility of increasing the risk of developing cancer for some patients. And then the last one I just want to briefly touch upon is a gene therapy approach called cell therapy. And one type of approach with cell therapy is called gene modified cell therapy. And with this approach, what we're doing is we're removing the cells of interest from the patient's body. So we take them, remove them from the body, and then we introduce a new gene or we fix that uh, faulty gene outside of the patient's body. Uh, and then once the genes are fixed, we will then reinfuse the modified cells um, that we have corrected back into the patient's body. So let's review again uh, a little more around the carriers and how they work. Um, so the gene therapy carriers are basically used, right, as we mentioned earlier, to take copies of a working gene. So it protects that working gene to the cells of interest in the person's body. And as I mentioned in hemophilia, that would be our liver cells. And essentially the role of the carrier is to really act as the protective packaging for our working copy of the gene. And it allows for the safe delivery to our target cells. It's important to remember that carriers um, are custom designed and they're based on viruses such as, you know, adeno associated viruses. However, they are not viruses themselves. So they cannot cause infection um, in humans.
again, you know, just to uh, remind us again to review it, you know, once we have our vector and the vector is, you know, when we have our carrier and we put our working copy of the gene inside it, then we're able to infuse it. And remember, it goes to our liver cells. It gets taken up into the nucleus. It deposits our working copy of the gene um, outside of our chromosome. So uh, it does not uh, get inserted into the chromosomes. Um, and then we are able to start making functional copies of either uh, protein, which is our factor eight or our factor nine. Now we'll take a, a, a look at the difference between what a virus is uh, compared to the gene therapy recombinant uh, dental associated viral carriers that, that you know, we're using in the gene therapy uh, trials. So here what we have is a cartoon of a virus which contains its own genetic um, information, which is this viral genome here in the squiggly line that's um, turquoise. Um, and it's inside of its own protective carrier or protein shell. Um, and, and it needs this in order to deliver this, uh, just like our carrier does with our working copy of the gene once it enters into um, our bodies. The difference between the carriers that we're using is that we strip out the viral genome, which this shouldn't be viral genome here. This, this should be the working copy of the gene, but we strip out the viral genome um, and we replace it with a working copy of the gene. But we're using the carrier or the protein shell um, of the virus, the technology from that in order to be able to deliver um, our working copy of the gene to where we want the um, you know, material to go. Now, what are some considerations we need to take when making a carrier for gene therapy? Uh, well, there are a few things we need to consider. And the first one is, you know, uh, based on how well our researchers you know, actually understand the virus that they're um, using in these clinical trials. The second thing is uh, how well the virus can target the cells of interest. Um, so for example, in hemophilia, as I mentioned, we want viruses that are going to want to target our um, liver cells, so our hepatocytes. And then last but most important is, you know, how safe are these viruses to use in patients? So a question we get a lot of times um, and people are curious about is, you know, well, how small are these carriers that we're talking about? Uh, and how many of them, you know, are we receiving, are patients getting with, a, with an infusion? So for comparison purposes, we'll look here on this slide, we can see, um, here we have the diameter of a pinhead. Uh, so this gray circle is the top of a pinhead. And we all know the size of a pinhead is quite small and it actually measures a thousand micrometers. So if we compare that now with a human hair, we can see that uh, the human hair measures in diameter uh, 50 to 100 micrometers, which that's approximately 10 to 20 times smaller than a pinhead. So now let's look at the red blood cell. Red blood cell is much smaller than the human hair. Uh, it's only seven uh, micrometers, and it's approximately seven to 14 times smaller than the human hair. And then lastly, we have our carrier, which is even smaller than our red blood cell, where it only measures in at 0 0.025 micrometers. Um, and that's approximately 280 times smaller than a red blood cell, or 40,000 times smaller than the size of the pinhead that's sitting here. So I think, you know, we might have a little better appreciation of how small these carriers actually are that we're using in gene therapy. And also to understand that these carriers, when we give an infusion, we are uh, delivering uh, somewhere in the range of you know, trillions of these carriers with the working copy of the gene inside of it. 
And the reason doing that is in hopes, you know, to really have the most successful outcome with these treatments in the patients. So what does an uh, antibody to recombinant AEB carrier mean uh, for you, the patient? Well, we'll go through um, a couple things, but the short answer is really that if you do have, um, you know, what is called a neutralizing antibody, you may not be eligible uh, for gene therapy treatment with that type of carrier um, that they're using. And I'm going to explain this, um, you know, what that means in a little more detail. So you might say, well, you know, how can I have a neutralizing antibody if I never receive gene therapy treatment? Well, it's because the reason people may have uh, antibodies already in their blood uh, to certain types of AAV is that AAV is a natural occurring virus that uh, we see in the environment. So you may have been already exposed to this virus at some point in your life, and you wouldn't even have known it. Um, so your body would then have produced, you know, these neutralizing antibodies against this natural occurring virus where we're using a carrier that's quite similar, um, and they would be able to then, you know, react to that gene therapy that we're administering to you. So if I have these pre-existing neutralizing antibodies, the question might be, well, what does that mean for me clinically? Well, if you do have them, then what it means is that they can block or destroy the carrier before it has a time to reach the cells of interest. So before it can get to your liver cells and they then will not be able to deliver the working copy of the gene. So the treatment would end up being uh, so much ineffective or you may see a much lower effective response than what was uh, initially desired with the treatment. So then we look at, you know, uh, what are the number of people that may have these antibodies? And uh, it can really vary depending on, you know, the patient's age, where we see that younger people are less likely to have antibodies. Uh, it could depend on the type of you know, carrier that's being used in, in the clinical trial. It can also depend on the region of the world where, you know, you live. It can differ from the East Coast or patients from the West Coast. Uh, so we estimate that right now that approximately anywhere from one third to two thirds of the general population will have some type of pre-existing neutralizing antibodies to these carriers. And then we get a question sometimes, you know, around, so how would I know if I then do have a pre-existing neutralizing antibody to a carrier? So what we're currently doing in most of the clinical trials are that patients are being, you know, tested. They receive a blood test prior to the enrollment uh, to ensure that they receive, you know, the best outcome, um, you know, with receiving that therapy. And if they do test positive for neutralizing antibodies, then we're going to exclude that patient from the clinical trial. There are uh, a few trials that may be allowing some patients to, you know, still receive treatment with pre-existing neutralizing, but the majority of them are not. Um, so if these uh, gene therapy trials in the future, you know, become successful and maybe make it to market, you know, I, I most likely expect that, you know, patients would probably need to be tested for neutralizing antibodies, which would be, you know, a simple blood test to see if they have them before they would be able to receive, you know, gene therapy with that specific carrier. So a question on your mind might be, well, why did we decide in hemophilia to target the liver? Um, instead of some other organ within uh, the patient's body. Well, there are two main reasons for that. The first one being that factor nine is naturally produced by the liver. Uh, and the second one is, you know, factor eight uh, is also, although not produced by the liver cells themselves, it gets produced by um, the lining of the tissues that are within um, the liver.
So that's the first reason why we chose the liver as a, an organ of choice. The second reason is that, you know, the liver cells in adults, they're long lived and they're slow dividing. So it's thought that uh, introducing the genetic material to the liver, that the effect will not be lost uh, by cell division or by cell death. So these are the reasons, you know, currently why recombinant AV gene therapy trials in hemophilia have focused on targeting the liver cells. So let's review again, you know, why it's important to know if you were uh, a patient that had a neutralizing antibody. Uh, and remember, neutralizing antibodies, you know, are produced by your immune system. Uh, if you've been exposed to AV in the past, uh, you know, out in the community. So we can see here we have neutralizing antibodies on the screen that are depicted in these little, um, you know, Y-shaped cartoon things down here. So this is a patient, if we looked at his bloodstream, he has neutralizing antibodies. So what happens if we were to infuse our recombinant AV carrier with our transgene, right? Well, what we'd see is that the neutralizing antibodies would bind to our recombinant AAV carrier, and it would basically, you know, surround that, and it would then prevent it from entering into our liver. So we would not be able to then deposit our working copy or a functional copy of the gene into our liver cell and into the nucleus in order to make the functional protein that our body would need. So let's take a look and see, you know, what if a patient doesn't have neutralizing antibodies? So we don't see those Y-shaped cartoons, now, right? So this patient doesn't have any neutralizing antibodies. And now we administer our vector, right, with our working copy of our gene and our carrier. So once we infuse that, uh, we're going to see that we have successful entry into the liver and we're able then to deposit that working copy of the gene into the cell nucleus um, of the liver cells. So let's just go through a little summary of what we covered so far um, and just high level reminders. You know, the reason hemophilia um, is a good you know, disorder to target with genetic medicine is because it's a disease that's known as a monogenetic disease. So it only has one gene defect. So a single gene is either missing or defective. So it's much, much easier in gene therapy to only have to replace a single working copy of a gene than multiple. Um, gene therapy using our recombinant AV carriers can carry you know, the functional gene to the desired site of the body. So we can target the tissue that we want uh, by picking a carrier that has that address on the outside of the packaging that goes to where we want it to go. We know that these vectors are very small in size and that we can infuse trillions of those into the patient to hopefully have successful transduction into our liver cells. Um, after uh, recombinant AV gene therapy, we know that cells in the body then are able to make functional copies uh, of our protein that we need, whether that be factor eight and factor nine. And it's important to uh, remind you that, you know, currently clinical trials are still ongoing and we continue to learn more every day and gather and understand, you know, safety and efficacy, um, you know, data as we move forward. So now we'll look a little closer or review a little bit more about, you know, specific to hemophilia and what makes gene therapy a potential treatment option for the patient uh, with hemophilia. And the first thing is I just mentioned in the previous slide is that, you know, hemophilia is caused by a single missing or dysfunctional protein, uh, which makes gene therapy easier when we only have to replace that one protein. The other thing is that, you know, even though we have highly effective treatments that are available currently um, in hemophilia, it still may be uh, burdensome for, you know, some patients where we know that they still require 
frequent, you know, IV or subcutaneous injections on a regular basis. And gene therapy may offer the chance, you know, for a one-time injection to control bleeding episodes over a long period of time. We also know that with small increases in factor levels, we can improve patients' bleeding profile. So we can improve the phenotype with only, you know, anywhere from maybe one to 3% increases. We can change a patient's phenotype from severe hemophilia to moderate hemophilia. And even with the gene therapies, we can get patients into the mild or, you know, normal range. So small increases of factor activity levels, we do see clinical benefit with patients. We also know it's easy to measure uh, factor levels to see if the gene therapy actually even works. So we have an objective validated measure that we're already using, you know, in hemophilia today. And lastly, you know, these working copies of the genes uh, we're able to fit these, so both the factor eight and the factor nine genes into these AAV-based uh, custom design carriers in order to deliver the working copy of the gene to our um, selected targets. So now we'll take a little look at um, the evolution of the gene trial, a uh, gene therapy trials. So, you know, questions we get sometimes, you know, how long has gene therapy been uh, studied? You know, when, how long ago did we start looking at gene therapies? So we can see as far back as in the early 80s, both factor eight and factor nine genes where they were first cloned is, uh, you know, where we initiated this. And then in late 90s and early 2000s is where we started early preclinical studies in the lab uh, which helped pave the way for gene therapy hemophilia trials. Then, as we can see by 2011, the University College of London in St. Jude conducted the first phase one and two gene therapy trials in hemophilia B patients, which showed both efficacy and durability. And then by 2015, we had the first hemophilia A trial, and by 2018 is where we moved into the phase three clinical trials for both hemophilia A and B. And then it leads us to where we are today in 2021, where we have several companies with phase three clinical trials that are ongoing. So what type of information are we looking at um, during our clinical trial? So what information are we gathering? Well, the primary information we're gathering are primary um, outcomes are listed here on the slide. And we can say they're, they're pretty similar across the phase three clinical trials for all the different companies. And they're mostly focused on the efficacy of gene transfer and gene expression, either by you know, directly measuring the amount of the factor protein or active or activity which is present in the patient's blood or by measuring the impact on their lives as they consume less you know replacement factor and they experience uh, fewer bleeds over the time period and then we are also looking at with regards to our primary outcomes you know heavily focused on the safety looking at liver health neutralizing antibodies any inhibitor development to the introduced factor or any other AEs that may be unexpected that occur during the clinical trial. With regards to the secondary outcomes, these, these can vary between clinical trials, uh, but the one that you know, is rising to the top that a lot of the companies now have incorporated as their secondary outcome measures is around um, you know, realizing the importance uh, to patients or the patient's experiences and quality of life as seen by the inclusion of, you know, the patient reported outcomes. And then some of the other ones that, you know, the companies are looking at that are important are immune response to the capsid, vector shedding, inhibitor development, how the gene therapy is actually working in the body. So the pharmacokinetics and the other ones that are listed here. So in summary, um, you know, at a high level, 
what we reviewed tonight was that, you know, possibly by administering a single gene therapy um, treatment, we may be able to see a long lasting um, effect in patients. We saw that both hemophilia A and B conditions uh, might respond well to gene therapy. We know there are still a lot of unknowns, uh, especially around, you know, which patients are the most appropriate and how long or the durability of the effect will last. And it's important to point out that currently, you know, um, there is no approved gene therapy treatment on the market. So all of uh, the gene therapy, uh, you know, trials are still ongoing in phase three. Um, and hopefully, you know, in the not so near future, you know, we will be able to bring uh, this to market as a uh, treatment option, option for patients with hemophilia. And with that, I'd like to thank everybody for your attention. Um, and I'll check the chat, I mean, the Q&A to see if there's any questions. All right, I'm looking. So I have a question here and I, I, I think it's around, um, you know, why is gene therapy? Is it a one-time only infusion? Uh, and I'll, I'll take that one first. The reason, you know, right now, well, there's two reasons. One is from the clinical effect where we're hoping we have a long duration. So we're hoping to be able to only have to deliver a one-time infusion. But I think your question is more around why would you not be able to redose or give, as you put here in the second sentence, a booster. And the reason for that is if you remember when I was talking about how one third to two thirds of the patients already have neutralizing antibodies in the community, right? Because they may have come in contact with natural occurring AAV. Well, you can only imagine, as I said, we're giving a patient with their first dose of gene therapy, trillions of these carriers, which are, uh, you know, mimicking, you know, uh, a, a natural occurring AAV. So these are recombinant, but they mimic that, that your immune system is gonna have an immediate response and develop neutralizing antibodies after you receive you know, that first gene therapy treatment if you were negative for neutralizing antibodies in the past. So I hope that answered it. And I will continue and say that you know, they are looking in, there's a lot of different you know, therapies that people are looking into to try to combat the neutralizing or overcome the neutralizing antibody effects so that we would be able to redose patients, but unfortunately, you know, none of those um, have been approved yet or are available at this time. And I see a question around, you know, gene therapies availability outside of hemophilia. Um, you know, the, that's something that maybe someday will be there. Unfortunately, you know, at least at Pfizer right now, we're, we're focused in both hemophilia A and B, but there's definitely, you know, discussions on, you know, other, other uh, patient types and things that, you know, down the road. So if you're thinking about patients with inhibitors, patients uh, who are younger, uh, maybe females, that's something, you know, that we're definitely, you know, talking about in-house, but I think we really need to complete our phase three trials with our hemophilia patients and, you know, learn from that and, and then see what we can do um, after that. And I don't think I really see any other questions that I on here, but I really want to thank everyone. I want to thank, you know, HFA for having Pfizer here and being able to provide this presentation this evening. Thank you. And I hope everyone has a good evening.
Thank you so much for that. That was such a wonderful presentation. It's always exciting to learn more about gene therapy. Every time I, I listen through a presentation, I learn a little bit more. Um, so thanks for your time and to Pfizer again for that. Um, I did want to let everybody know I'm going to put a link right here in the chat. Um, we do produce an annual uh, issue of our quarterly magazine, uh, Dateline Federation, that is a product guide on new and emerging therapies. Uh, you'll be able to find last year's issue on our website and it has a lot of information around emerging therapies uh, and a list of all of the products that are undergoing clinical trial from Pfizer and other companies at the moment. So definitely check out uh, that issue if you have not seen it already. And I'm just going to go ahead and put a link to Pfizer's um, exhibit hall uh, virtual webpage. So if you have any other questions or are looking for more information information around Pfizer and what, what they have to offer for resources, please navigate over to their uh, webpage on our exhibit hall. Um, and with that, that'll be the end of the session. I do want to remind you that there will be a survey that pops up as an evaluation. It should probably open in a new web browser as we close out this Zoom. We would love to hear your feedback. Uh, and then um, for the rest of the night, we do have a seven o'clock session for our Spanish speaking community members. It is a cooking demonstration. So if you do speak Spanish uh, or you're just up for listening or watching a cooking demonstration happen, definitely check out that session that will start at 7 p.m. Eastern. For those of you um, who are not interested in that session, at 8 o'clock, we will have our research poster presentation. Uh, so if um, you have not done so already, check out all of the research posters that are available on our website, run a, right under the research hall uh, tab on the menu. And we hope to see you at 8 o'clock where you can meet the individuals who conducted the research. Um, so thank you so much again, Cosmo and, and Pfizer for this session. We really appreciate you being here. No, thank you, Kyle, and thank you everyone for attending this evening. Have a great night. <laughs>